We've all seen the warning labels. Handle with care. That would be my description. Or maybe the sticker that's plastered on some packages that says fragile. Handle with care, right? What do you think of when you think of gentleness? I think of that newborn baby that we just sang about. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the joy, pride and joy she brings. Oh, wait. He brings. I used to change it when my girls were coming. <laughs> But when my children were born, I was amazed at how small and helpless they were, even though they were much bigger than a lot of babies I've held since that time. I treated them as the most precious thing in my life. Today, when I visit uh, newborn babies in the hospital, I, I try not to hold them. I just think they're so fragile, and they belong to somebody else, and they're responsible for the safekeeping of that little one. And so I would kind of decline, and reluctantly sometimes at baby dedications, I would take the baby and, and pray for them. The more fragile the object of our compassion, the greater care we show them. And gentleness, too, depends who you are. Uh, so for most of my life, I was a Baptist. And some of them say, oh, those hard-shelled Baptists. You know, you don't have to be gentle with a Baptist because they have hard shells. Well, now I'm a shell fisherman. And I realize that when you're out raking cohogs, you can just, you know, you can just scratch your rake over the top of them and it's not going to hurt them. I think with all of the pecks of quahogs that I've harvested, I've only broken one with a rake. Now, soft shells are another story. And I would try to go and, and talk to the people who were down there digging for the soft shell clams. And I've tried it a few times. And I break about as many as I'm able to harvest because they're fragile. You have to handle them with care. And so you dig around them and you kind of manipulate them down and, and try to pull them out. Someone told me that it's like trying to dig raw eggs out of sand, if you can imagine. So my, by my definition of gentleness, the opposite would be a thoughtless carelessness of someone in your life. And I think typified by the word harsh. Gentle on one side, the gentleness and harshness on the other side. Not caring. Handling someone or something, but more someone because we're talking about relationships with other people. To be careful how we treat other people in our lives. So let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come together, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to see you as you are. And help us, Father, to see how we can connect with you in such a way that we can experience the fullness of the fruit of your spirit. And we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So first of all, I want you to see that God is gentle. Most of the world today acknowledges that God exists. 
but they don't have a right view of who God is. To them, God is angry. Uh, I've been in temples in Taiwan, and when you enter the temple, you see these beautifully done idols, gold idols, but they're so angry. And when you go in there, you think, boy, th this is what people view God as. They think that God is not pleased with the way we're living, and, and that might be true. But God's first instinct is not judgment and anger, but it's mercy, tender mercies. Over and over again, if you read through the Bible, You'll see, even in the Old Testament, it talks about the tender mercies of God, an aspect of who God is. But God, probably more than anything else, is a self-revealing being. He wants to reveal himself to each one of us and mankind as a whole. That's his desire. Uh, I learned this in a Sunday school class uh, at Osterville Baptist Church. Some of you may remember Avery Nesbitt, and, and Avery taught the adult Sunday school class there. And he said that term uh, that we translate as, as Jehovah or Yahweh can be translated, I am who you will find me to be. Not that we are creating an image of God, but that he is revealing himself to us. And he's saying to us, this is who I am. And he does that through nature, through general revelation, but also through special revelation that we have in his word, the Bible. He revealed himself to us in his son, the living word, and in the Bible, his written word. And as we read his Bible, as we experience nature, he reveals himself or continues to reveal himself to us. So the Bible reveals not the picture of an angry, vengeful God who takes delight in torturing people, but a gentle, compassionate God who patiently waits for people to repent and return to him. John Calvin pointed this out in his, uh, book, his commentary on the book of Isaiah. Pointing out this, he wrote, but the prophet's meaning, I think is different and is more correctly explained according to my judgment and by other commentators who think that he draws a distinction between God's disposition and man's disposition. Men are wont to judge and measure God from themselves. For their hearts are moved by angry passions and are very difficult to be appeased. And therefore they cannot be reconciled to God when they have offended him. But the Lord shows that he is far from resembling men. So that sense of judgment that we have you know, probably the most uh, frequent thing <coughs> that happens to us is someone cutting us off in traffic, um, and our anger gets a little bit aroused. And so we think, boy, that guy's going to get in an accident someday, and it's going to deserve him right. Well, that's not the way God thinks. You know, God is merciful. God would slow down and let the people who've been waiting out into the traffic. That's our God. We see that in the scripture passage that we read this morning in Exodus 34. This is the Lord revealing himself to Moses on the, on the mount. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third 
and fourth generation. The New Living Translation puts it this way. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh the Lord, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. By the New Living Translation, because it says in uh, the English Standard Version, to thousands. But here it says thousands of generations. I don't know how many generations have passed from Adam to our generation, but I'm sure it's thousands, many, many, many generations. You know, God had originally told Adam and Eve, the day you sin, you will die. Why didn't they die right away? He was being merciful for our sakes so that we could be born and become the children of God. These verses are prominent in the Old Testament. You can read them or some verses like them in Numbers 14, 18, Nehemiah 9, 17, 13 and 22, Psalm 5, 8, Psalm 69, 14, Psalm 86, 5 and 15, Psalm 103, 8, 145, 8, Isaiah 63, 7, Joel 2, 13, Jonah 4, 2, and Nahum 1, 3. We have a tendency, though, to think that God is vindictive, don't we? I had a friend who worked as a nurse, and he had one of those pocket protectors. And uh, every time he would bend over, his pens would drop out. And he said, oh, it's just the devil trying to get to me. So one of his coworkers one day started to swear, and, and Chuck just kind of started to move back like this. And the guy gave him a funny look, and he said, what are you doing? And he says, well, I don't want to be around you when God goes. Oh, he's waiting for us to come back to him. He made a way for our salvation. We shouldn't base our view of God on the fall of man, but on the creation of God. James wrote, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Amen. All of the good things that we experience every day, beautiful sunset, the leaves on the trees, I guess they've all pretty much changed now, but the beauty that surrounds us, walking down the beach, uh, I kid the other uh, shell fishermen that we are a part of the scenery as we're out there raking for clams. But all those things, God put all that beauty around us. And he said, we are to be the first fruit. But what was the deception James was, uh, was addressing here? It's that God tempts us to sin. And he said, no, no. God has never tempted any of us to sin. But that's what people think, that he kind of dangles temptation in front of us, trying to get us to sin so that he can come down on us in judgment when really it's just the opposite. Most people don't think that God has a wonderful plan for our lives. But he does. He wants us, as James would say, to be uh, the first fruits of his creation. How do we do that? Love, joy, peace, all of those wonderful fruit of the Spirit. So the Father <coughs> is full of gentleness toward us. But next we see 
the gentleness of the Father is also revealed in Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus himself said, I am gentle. Uh, this wasn't really a surprise to those who followed him. It was a surprise to those who wanted and waited for a political victory. Those who wanted a purple wave of a future reigning king of Israel who would come and annihilate Rome and all of the other enemies of Israel. They tried at times to make him king when he was able to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. How this king could support an army. You know, we read daily, almost daily, of the problems that Russia is having with their supply lines. Here would be a king who could lead an army that wouldn't need any supplies, who could feed an army with five loaves and two fish. That was the king they wanted, a king who could supply all of their needs. But the king or the Messiah that they received was one who reached out to a Samaritan woman, who reached out to a centurion who had a sick servant. Not the king that they had in mind. Not the king that they had seen in Scripture. But Jesus was the gentle shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. Thanks be to God, we received a king that would with love draw our heads and our hearts gently back to himself. But what is the gentleness of Jesus? Well, gentleness, I think, is strength under control. And to be the most gentle, you would have to be the most strong. The omnipotence of God in Christ Jesus could bring a gentleness that the world had never known. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 that he emptied himself. I like to think of it as a veiling. He veiled the power. He veiled the identity. And at certain times, that identity was revealed. At his baptism, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus revealed himself for who he really was, and his three closest disciples fell to the ground. Someone said they assumed the position of worship before a holy God. His power again was displayed on the night he was arrested. When the mob came to arrest Jesus, Jesus said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. Does that sound familiar? It should. No Jewish person would say, I am, because that was the name for God. But Jesus, with that one statement, took aside the veil that covered his deity, that covered his omnipotence. And when the soldiers who came to arrest him saw him as he truly was, they fell back on the ground. What an incredible power. For most of his life, that power was veiled. But he demonstrated it 
to his disciples, to those closest to him. Now, we need to tap into the connection that will bring gentleness and these other fruit of the Spirit into our lives. So we've seen that the Father is gentle. We've seen that the Son is gentle. But we'll see that our connection to Him is through the Holy Spirit. How can we, Pastor preached on the goodness of God, how can we be good because only God is good? Oh, because we're connected. And, and we need that connection. I, we, we need, have you ever had that experience with your internet where you see that little round thing going around in circles? Or you're watching TV streamed from your internet connection, that's what we do, and all of a sudden it'll say, there's trouble with your connection, try again later. Right in the middle of a television show. Then you have to go over and unplug the thing and plug it back in again. Well, some of us have that problem with the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're not really connected. I wonder if God ever gets frustrated. But we get disconnected with him. He sees that little circle going around. He says, oh, no, not again. Oh, man. So we need that. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, and that kind of explains a little bit uh, what we're talking about. He said, and I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, literally, it's he lifts up. And if you've ever had grapes, you know that the grapes can't lay on the ground and be delicious. If the vine is on the ground, the grapes are sour, nasty little chunks or whatever. Not worth eating. So he takes and he lifts them up. In Israel, one of my professors was going through Israel, and, and they stopped the bus, and he, he, he saw in the fields a lot of vines, and they had rocks underneath them. And he asked the bus driver, what's, the, what's going on here? And he said, well, the, the vines naturally lay on the ground. But the husbandman comes, and he lifts the vine up, and he puts a rock at the end. And very gradually and gently, he continues to move the rock closer to the stem until the vine is able to go up and, and get the light from the sun and produce the sweet fruit that we have as grapes. So he lifts us up, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me. That's the connection. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So see the progression there in verse 2. There are those who bear fruit. And then again in verse 2, it says they'll bear more fruit. And verse 5 said they'll bear much fruit. And that's our desire, that we not only bear little fruit, but a lot of fruit to the glory of God. In a beautiful unity of the second and third member of the Trinity, we see the fruit of the Spirit of God produced in the vine that is the believer abiding in Christ. <coughs> Connected to the Holy Spirit and how he lives his life in and through us. But does it come naturally? You know, should I just uh, you know uh, sit back and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for your Holy Spirit. No, it comes supernaturally as the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Consider Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus displayed the power of the Spirit when he spoke the holy name. 
The result was that those who came to arrest him were thrown to the ground by the power of the word. In the same account, we see another participant who responded in the power of the flesh. Yep, good old Peter. Whips out his sword, tries to cut the head off at the high priest's servant. In the power of the flesh, Peter missed the guy's neck and cut off his ear. We're tempted to make fun of Peter and how often we do the exact same thing. We try to live in the spirit we try to produce the fruit of the Spirit in the power of the flesh. We think, I've got to be gentle. I've got to be tender. But then we say the most insensitive thing and hurt the ones we should be trying to help. That's why God gave me a wife. She points out those things to me. You shouldn't have said it that way. You shouldn't have. That was quite a hurtful thing. And I can remember, you know, 30 years ago, talking to someone who had visited the church out, and I said some foolish thing, and, and my wife said, I can't believe you said that to her. I can't even remember what I said now. But it wasn't the right thing. How, how often do we do that? We need to be under the control of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray that God will give us a gentle spirit to interact with his children, the church, and also those who need to come to him for salvation. And we thank God that the story didn't end like that for Peter. We see a transformation in the life of Peter that was nothing short of miraculous. In fact, some people think that Second Peter could not have been written by Peter because he was just an ignorant fisherman. And Second Peter is just a classical piece of literature. But we know what happened to Peter. In chapter 1, Peter is told to wait in Jerusalem for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Peter received the Holy Spirit. And with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in his life, in chapter 2, he opened up the door of the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. The early estimate of the number of the people in the church of Jerusalem was 250,000 people. Chapter 8, again, in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, Peter opened the door of the gospel to the people in Samaria. Remember back in Matthew 16, Jesus said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. And he opened the door first to the people in Jerusalem and Judea, then in Samaria. In chapter 10, Cornelius, a representative of those who would be the uttermost parts of the earth. Peter used the key, and the key in his life was the Holy Spirit. Because those doors opened, <laughs> we're Christians today. So only as we keep connected to the Holy Spirit and we bring the gentleness and kindness. Uh, when Jack preached on kindness, I thought... If, if this was a family, if the fruit of the Spirit was the family, love would be the Father, and each one of these would be the products of love in our lives. But kindness and gentleness would be twins, very closely related. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.1, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ. We need to seek his presence, not to do this in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Does anybody want to be treated gently? The picture of Jesus and the Lamb up there, look at that picture. Isn't that a great picture? Do you notice how the Lamb is just snuggled up next to Jesus? Or the, I should say the shepherd. But notice his wrist as well. The nail print in his hand. Would you like that connection? 
would you just enjoy being with him and being able is it okay to say cuddle <laughs> as the shepherd gently <clears throat> takes that lamb the powerful wise wonderful good shepherd from Psalm 23 takes that little lamb and can you feel yourself just leaning into him I remember the texture of my dad's leisure suit back in the 60s the Sunday night just being held by him who was one of the best gentlemen that I have ever known and he just held me during that service and I just like this little lamb nestled up to him that's our shepherd that's God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit I challenge you today to reform your view of who God is. When I take Hunter for a walk out in the woods, he has a tendency to wander off. And in my relationship with the Lord, I must say that I have the same tendency to wander off and go my way. But one of the things that I'll do after I get Hunter's attention, I'll just kind of go down like this, and I'll say, Hunter, come! And he comes running back to me with his tail wagging, all excited. Runs right past me, but <laughs> he does run to me. And oftentimes when I do that, afterwards I'll look up into, he into the heavens and say, Lord, that's the relationship I want to have with you. I want to just be in your presence. And my love language is touch. <laughs> and so to feel his embrace and to become again like that newborn baby. And I think that's the verse we'll close on uh, this morning. Uh, from because he lives, how sweet to hold a newborn baby. So would you stand and we'll sing together.